This morning's message is taken from Numbers 13 and 14. We're going to read it in just a moment. But it's the account of how God brought the children of Israel across the Red Sea and down into what we would call the bottom land below the, the promised land. And you all probably remember that they wandered around for 40 years But the reason they did that was because of what happened here in the 13th and 14th chapter. And Moses sends 12 spies up into the promised land, and he says, go check it out. See what it's all about. Well, they did that, and they saw everything for 40 days. Now, unfortunately, which we'll find out here in a moment, um, 10 of the 12 said, this is way too big a job. This is not God's will. We're not going to go there. And then God pronounced judgment upon Israel and said, you will wander around this whole region for 40 years, one for each day that they were up in, in Palestine spying out the land. So we're going to read about that today, and we're going to look at a message that has a simple and somewhat humorous title, Spies, Chickens, and Leaders. And so uh, if, you make, if you're a note taker like I am, on the back of the bulletin, there's a place for that. So it's a rather lengthy portion, so I'm just going to have you remain seated. We're going to start with the 26th verse of the 13th chapter of Numbers and read down through the 9th verse of the 14th chapter. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. And they reported to them the end of the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. And they gave Moses this account. This is what the 12 spies came back after 40 days. This is what they said. We went into the land to which you sent us. And it does. I'm going to add the word in fact. Now, it may, that may not be exactly right, but you get the idea of what they're reporting. Um, and it does, in fact, flow with milk and honey. And here's the fruit to prove it, because they'd taken grapes from a place called Eskol, and, and they were so big, they put it on a, a big pole between two guys' shoulders. Now, I don't know if they were this big around, or it was just, just to show what it was. I've seen pictures where it's that, and I'm not sure it's quite like that, but anyway. Uh, and here's the fruit to prove it. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large, And we even saw the descendants of Anak there, descendants of giants, huge men. And besides that, the Amalekites live in the Negev. That's the place they went. The Hittites, Jebusites, and Ammonites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live near the sea along the Jordan. They're everywhere. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him, the ten, said, We can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. And they said, The the land we explored devours those living in it. That's a little bit of a stretch, isn't it? All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak, come from the Nephilim. And it seemed like grass, we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. That night, all the people of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in this desert, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly, gathered there. Joshua and Caleb, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and he'll give it to us. Only don't rebel against the Lord and don't be afraid of the people of the land because we will swallow them up. 
Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us, so don't be afraid. Heavenly Father, we have a tendency in our culture to look at people that are famous or can do a certain task well, or they're appointed to a leadership position, or maybe they've earned it, or in the military, whatever the situation might be. And it's certainly possible, Lord, we've come into this place with a general understanding that there are leaders and followers, and that's true in every organization of any kind. But it's also true that your church is different, and you've called us to be leaders. Maybe not the person who plays the instrument, maybe not the person who does the preaching or sits on a board or is the manager at work or runs a whole assembly plant. But you've called your people to be leaders. And if we glean anything from this text today, we learn how you see the chickens and the leaders. So I ask you to give me the kind attention of your people for the next few moments as we look at your word. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we read it already, and I'm not going to recap it. But we start with 12 spies. And it's obvious, I just want to point this out as a jumping off place, that all 12 men, one from each of the 12 tribes, go up into the promised land, they look it over, they do a reconnaissance mission, and I think you'd all agree, all 12 saw the same exact thing. They didn't, they didn't stand around the 12 and say, well, this is how you see it, and this is how I see it. They all saw the same thing. Now, how much they talked about it over 40 days, the Bible doesn't tell us. On their trip back, to, who knows how much they said, but... All of the chickens and all of the leaders saw the same exact thing, but came up with a very different conclusion. So there are 12 spies, but there's 10 chickens, 10 chickens. Now the question might come to your heart as it did to mine in my study time, how do you identify the chickens? I mean, if you lined up the 12 spies and looked at them one by one, you wouldn't be able to look at them and say, no, there's a chicken. Everybody knows he's a chicken. He doesn't have any courage. He's full of fear. And, and well, Caleb and Joshua, well, we, they're leaders. Everybody knows that. No. When they got back, they revealed themselves, didn't they? It showed pretty clearly who they were and what they were. So how do you identify chickens? And I would suggest, like verse 33, chickens are fear-first thinkers. Chickens are fear-first thinkers. And it's interesting in verse 33, we read it, but notice that it does not say that all the people in the land looked at us as grasshoppers. They say, we looked at ourselves as grasshoppers and we're sure they did too. Now, what is a grasshopper? Is is there some big spiritual context we're supposed to draw from the grasshopper? No, it's just this small and insignificant, powerless and so he said, uh, the, the 10 spies said, as they talked among each other, they said, we, we looked at, when we were there, we looked around at everything and all the circumstances and our conclusion, the 10 of us, was that we were, we felt like we were grasshoppers in that land without power, without influence. And the last thing we would, would want to do is try to conquer these great big people with their walled cities and, and we wouldn't want to do it because they were fear. They were fear-first thinkers. There's a lot of other things they said, but we're just going to unpack these one at a time. Chickens are generally fear-first thinkers. Secondly, chickens don't keep their fears to themselves. We read it, but it says in verse number um, 32, and they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. And it's interesting, any time a chicken tells something out of fear, they always add something that somebody should say that can't possibly be true. And their next statement is, the the land we saw explored, that we explored, devours those living in it. Is that the most nonsensical thing you ever heard in your life? They came back and the 10 said, and by the way, everybody in the land are destroying themselves. We don't have to do much, they'll just kill each other. That's not, that's a fear statement, isn't it? 
It devours those that are living there. And, and I think maybe the King James says anybody that would try to make it different, that they would be devoured. And chickens generally don't keep their fears to themselves. It's a little bit like gossip. And uh, this is not a, a downer message. I've shared gossip, things I shouldn't uh, at times over the years. And, but I will tell you this. It's been my personal experience that generally speaking, most gossip is true. It just shouldn't be told. It's rare that I've had somebody tell me something that was gossip-like, and I found out later, well, that wasn't true. More times than not, there was an element of truth, or it was true. And so chickens, keep, they don't keep their fears to themselves. Notice with me, please, we're not going to reread it again, but in chapter 14, verses 1 through 4, it just keeps going on and on. They're wailing, they're crying, and after 430 years in Egypt... They cry out and say, haven't we, haven't we had enough? Haven't we been up against it long enough, God, that you brought us out here? Let us die in the desert rather than be slaughtered by these people in the land you promised us. Haven't we had it hard enough? Let us just die here. And there's another indicator or characteristic of a chicken. And chickens can't manage themselves very well because what they say, let's choose a leader to get us back to Egypt. They're, they're not, you've, you've heard herding cats. One of the Super Bowl commercials years ago was about cowboys on horses trying to herd thousands of cats. It was hilarious. But the one thing the chickens can't do is the people that are fearful, the people that say it's too big of a job, we can't do it, why would we try? The people that go there, that they're all going to be killed, devoured. And you would, you would say, well, the chickens can't say, let's go back. No, nope, let's elect a leader, somebody that will get us back. And then a fourth indicator or characteristic of chickens is that they are not generally curious they almost never say, could God be in this? Could God be up, up to something here? And they don't generally think back about the Red Sea or how he provided for them in Egypt and the great exodus where the Egyptian people just poured blessing upon blessing. And they said it on one hand after the death of the firstborn, which affected uh, all of the Egyptians, but not the Israelites. Here, take this, these gold and silver pots and these ornaments and this food and just get out of here. But here they, they... Did they forget that? Looks like maybe they did. Chickens aren't generally curious, and they rarely ask, could God be up to something here? Now, I want to... I've got kind of a transition slide here, and I, I felt like God told me to put it in because it's so important. Uh, chickens and late adopters are not the same thing. Okay? I'm going to use just a couple examples from our church, which could be in any church or any organization. The last thing I want to do is suggest to you today that if you disagree with somebody, that you're a chicken. Or that you don't like the direction something's going, that you're fearful and you can't manage yourself. Or that you're going to spread it all around about what's wrong with the guy in charge in here. Or whatever job or school, whatever it might be. Because there are in any organization, and the church is just like that, because it's made up of people like you and me. There's early adopters. I've mentioned this before, but it bears repeating. There's early adopters, which means pastor, the guy at work, the gal that's leading your committee, whatever it is. They make a suggestion, this is the new vision, this is where we're going, and the early adopters say, let's go. Man, I don't understand all that, but I'm with you. And the middle adopters, they may not say it, but they say to, they say to themselves and others, i got to wait and get more information. You see, it's different. I, I'm an information guy, but when it comes to making decisions, and my wife will tell you, I've made some horrible decisions. But for the most part, when we make a decision, I don't look back and say, what if? I just keep going. I take all the information I have, I make a decision, and if it doesn't work, I say, well, I learned how not to do it. And that's just my, my nature. That's how I process things. But then there's the late adopters. 
And the late adopters will say things like, um, well, I'm just going to wait and see how many people give for this specific project, and we'll see how the people do. It's not that they're totally against it. They just want to see if this is what God's doing. And so to say that a person disagrees with leadership, a person has a different insight, a person has a different way of viewing it or how they process information, late adopters and chickens are not the same. They're not the same thing at all. Because every organization, including the church, has people who look at the same thing and say they see it differently. That's just the way it is. And it's okay. Now, just let me give you just a little bit of an example. A little bit of an example is that let's suppose that uh, Pastor Randy said we're going to, uh, we're just going to add on to this building. It's going to cost $1.5 million and blah, 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 blah. There's some people would say, man, look what God's done so far in four years. I'm with you. And there's other people that would say, well, I just gave money for the down payment. I'm not sure I'm going to have more money for something else. And there'd be others that say, let's wait and see. Or there might be people who would come to him or me or someone or someone in leadership and say, the timing just doesn't feel right to me. And you know what? You having an opinion and a thought that differs does not make you a chicken. It just doesn't. But in this circumstance, there were chickens and there were leaders. And the chickens identified themselves pretty quickly. Well, there were 12 spies, 10 chickens, and two leaders. Joshua and Caleb. So let's wind up our time together and identify leaders. And it's in the Scriptures. In verses 8 and 9 of the 14th chapter, we learn that leaders are faith-first thinkers instead of fear-first thinkers. They say, we saw the same things the other 10 saw. You're right, the walls of the cities are thick, and yeah, there's some big guys there, but we've come all this way, everything from from Joseph going down into Egypt to help a nation that was going to be starving, and then, and then um, Joseph's people are brought down in as a gift and redemption so that they didn't starve. Joseph rises to number two in all of Egypt, and then God leads them out, and the leaders look back and say, look at the track record of the God we serve and love and how he's protected us. So they think faith first instead of fear first. And I mentioned it as I read it, but I'm going to highlight it again. Down about verse number, well, it's at the end of verse number number nine. It says, don't rebel against the Lord. Don't be afraid of the people of the land because we will swallow them up. Their protection is gone. But the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. I love this phrase, their protection is gone. The Lord is with us. Don't be afraid. When I look at that, they haven't even come into the promised land yet. They haven't raised the sword at the first place. They haven't assembled the armies of the 12 tribes of Israel. They haven't done any of that. And yet the two leaders said in our eyes, not only are we not grasshoppers, but they've lost all the protection they ever had. Before it's even done. And then a third indicator or characteristic of leaders is that they can manage themselves and others. Most of us, and I know this is true for me and probably for most of you, that whether it's work or school or in the church or in your family, most of us are happy to be managed by people who have proven they can manage themselves. Most of us can. I enjoyed working, driving school bus for three and a half years for Bath. And I worked for five years at Allen Knott Honda. And I wasn't the grand poobah. I wasn't the guy in charge. I was under somebody else's authority. But in the places I worked there and other places, I trusted that these people knew how to manage me, find my gifts and put them to work. And even in the times when it didn't go the way I hoped it would or thought it would or something wasn't totally fair, I thought, these people can manage themselves. These are people who know what to do. They have experience. I can learn from them. And I think most of us would say the same. Leaders can manage themselves and others. Robert E. Lee became the president of the Confederacy at the end of the war 
But he said, I cannot trust a man to control others who cannot control himself. And so when you have people at work, that's just a good example, people at work that can't control their temper, can't control what they say about other people in front of you, and then you know that they're going to talk about you in front of other people. People who cannot control themselves are the kind of people who should not be trusted with authority, by and large. Now, again, just as I'm saying that, that uh, the chickens and late adopters or middle adopters are not the same, that needs clarified. Uh, it needs to be clarified here. It doesn't mean that leaders always get it right. It doesn't mean we never make a mistake. It doesn't mean we don't have failings or, or there's, there's a chink in our armor or there's somewhere along the line we might not get it right or even fail or even sin. But overall, in the big picture, God calls leaders who you can put your trust in and they can manage and lead you. And for the most part, you'll say, lead on. I have confidence because I've watched your life and I know how you're living your life. And as a result, you have the, earned the right to lead me. Let's look at another one. Chickens infect others with fear, but leaders inspire other people with faith and to leadership. I tell you about every time I preach how old I am and how long we've been married and how long it's been since I've been in high school, and I don't need to repeat all that. But I will tell you that some of the most influential people in my life were high school teachers, especially my music teachers, band, choral, class teachers. And when we went to college, a couple of my professors had tremendous impact upon my life and still do pastors I met along the way, some younger, some older, and my goodness, the, the faith and the inspiration I received from them. I wonder how many, how many people at Bath, and, and again, it could be any school, how many teachers at Bath would look back in their schooling years and say, I became a teacher because of a teacher. I became a coach because of a coach. And they refer to somebody who's made such a tremendous impact on their lives. I remember t something as clearly, now my, my hearing and my memory is not quite as sharp as it was a long time ago, but I remember it as clearly as it happened yesterday. And both the band director and the choral director pulled me into their office. I was starting to hang with the wrong kids. And you might say at Waynesfield, how could you do that? Well, we had some hell raisers at Waynesfield too. And, and, and they looked at me and said, Mark, we just see who you are. And if you keep hanging with these guys, you're going to find yourself in a place you don't want to be. He says, you just, need to, you just need to back away from that. And I was a sophomore in high school or something like that. And I realized, man, these people are trying to manage me for my own good. And I stopped doing what those guys were doing. And it's not like we went out and set cars on fire or burned down barns or killed animals. But... Just being in the wrong crowd, thinking the wrong things, doing the wrong things, I was letting them lead me. And what they were saying in essence was, Mark, we see you as a leader, and so you need to decide what kind of leader you're going to be. And I walked out of that room that day, not angry, but I walked out and said, I want to be the kind of leader you two are. I'd like to think that there's a lot of nurses that are in the nursing um, profession, because it's some, somewhere along the line, either their parents or they had a child or they knew someone that was such a blessing that they said, that's where I want to invest my life. And they go to nursing school. Or I wonder how many businessmen or women started out and, and they learned from a leader, from a mentor. They learned from somebody and they were inspired by that. And as a result... They became a businessman or woman. They became somebody like that. And I'd also like to think as moms and dads that our children would look at us as leaders in our families and say, uh, you know, and I love the commercial about uh, uh, being a foster parent or adopting a child. And they, they, they talk about, and you go to a big rock concert with your kid and you don't, under, it's so loud and you don't know what to say. You don't have to be a perfect parent to be a foster parent. <laughs> Most of us parents would say, man, I wish I had some things back that I blew. But, but a wonderful thing is when our children say, when I'm a dad, I hope I'm like my dad. When I'm a mom, I hope I'm like my mom. 
because that's where they learn it, and they learn leadership in the home first. It's so tremendously powerful. Chickens have a way of inf infecting others with fear, but leaders inspire others with, fit, with faith and leadership. And finally, leaders are generally curious and ask the question, what is God up to here? There's times in my life, I got to tell you, I won't go into any specifics, but I don't get it. Something we ask God to change, he hasn't, at least that we can see. Things are not going the way that Diane and I hoped they would or anticipated they would or they, they should, actually, or whatever it might be. That might be true at work. It might be true in your church. It might be true in your home, your family, at school, wherever it might be. But I would encourage you to be reminded that leaders are generally curious people, and they ask the question, what is God up to here? What's going on? What, God, what might he be doing? And the chickens clearly identified themselves. They looked at the same exact circumstances as the 12, and yet they became, became the majority. But the other two took their shirts, and I, I, I envision it like a, like a world wrestling guy going, rah, and tearing his shirt. You know, Joshua and Caleb said, what's wrong with you people? Can't you see what God's up to? He's in this. We can do this. And maybe they would say this more quietly. We should be thinking about what God's up to here instead of just being fearful. Roy T. Bennett said, great leaders create more leaders, not followers. I've heard it said this way, and it's just a weird thing. But you know, the Bible often refers to the people of God as sheep. But you, you know this, sheep reproduce sheep. Shepherds don't reproduce sheep. Shepherds reproduce shepherds. Chickens reproduce chickens, and leaders reproduce leaders. Now, you might be tempted to say about this time, so what's the big idea? Simply this. God calls all of us to be leaders. Maybe not to stand here, maybe not to play an instrument, but something much more impactful in many ways. I'll speak to those in school first. If you're in school and you see a bully who consistently tries to rough up another child, you'll be amazed what happens if you be a leader and step into that and say, I'm not going to be afraid. I'm going to step in and stand beside that guy or that gal that's cornered by their locker. I'm going to break that up. Now, I, I know you'll find this somewhat stupid and funny, but I weigh almost 100 pounds more than I did when I was in high school. I was about this big around. One day we're sitting in a shop class. Teacher leaves. Two of the roughest kids in the school got up and hit one of the other kids right in the middle of his back. And the, my first thought was, they'll kill me if I do anything. And they, hit, and they had families that were tough. But I got up and said, leave him alone. Leave Steve alone. What are you going to do about it? I said, leave him alone. I thought for sure they'd wait for me after school, school and beat the crap out of me. But they didn't. If you're at school and somebody's on the phone and, and they're telling stuff, they're, they're, they're showing you things about uh, what others are saying about another girl, just say, I'm not interested in that. That takes, to be, that takes a real leader to be able to do that and say, I'm not going to listen to that. Don't show me that stuff. Or you have a, a boy that says, Look what I downloaded off the internet last night. You want to see this? Well, of course he wants to see it. But he says, no, I'm not a chicken. I'm a leader. No, I don't want to see that. Don't show me that kind of stuff. And you say, Pastor, you're not understanding what the genes and the hormones are like all through this thing. I said, yeah, I do. I'm old, but I'm not dead and I'm not blind. Yeah, I'm not. And so when I pick up these, these kids for LifeWise and... <laughs> I won't go into the story because it's too long and uh, embarrassing in some ways. But the kids get on and they use verbiage that they think I don't understand. <laughs> and some of it's sexual in nature. These innocent little seventh grade boys. You would never think that they would be like that. But it takes a leader to say, that's enough of that. Well, I had to say enough of it one time. If you're at work and you see something, something that's 
not just. If you see something in the church where somebody's saying something that is fear-related, not that it's, it's, again, it's okay to question someone. It's okay to say, I don't understand the, 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 all the information behind the decision we made, and, and to question that or ask somebody in authority. That's 100% legitimate. But to sit around with three or four couples in your home or at some place and just say something like this, I don't, I don't know. I don't know where we got this pastor guy. Man, he's way off base, don't you think? Yeah, I didn't want to say anything, but I did. I'm thinking that too. That's chicken talk. No, just be honest. Talk to him if you have concerns. Talk to me if you have concerns. At work, at school, in church, in your family, because God has called all of us to be leaders and spiritual leaders. Are there other things that could come out of this portion of Scripture? Yeah, probably. But this is what God laid upon my heart. God calls all of us to be leaders and to stand where Joshua and Caleb stood and to see the end and what God's up to. Now I'm going to ask you to just bow your hearts before the Lord for just a moment. Is there a situation where you need to stand a little taller, be a little stronger, not take it anymore, Defend a friend or a coworker or somebody in your family and simply be a leader instead of a chicken. Because I can tell you plainly, chickens don't go very far. They just don't make it. They die along the side of the road. They, they just don't cut it. But leaders can accomplish great things by simply asking the question, I think God's in this. I wonder what he's up to. I'm going to ask our worship team to come back, and if you wouldn't mind, could we sing the second song that we sang, the second one? That was wonderful. And then we'll conclude here in a moment. When we fight our battles, we do it on our knees. It's not our expertise. It's just casting fear away and being people of faith. Instead of grumbling and mumbling against you, we say the power of the enemy is already gone. We're going to walk in you. Father, these characteristic or or indicators of both leaders and chickens came out of the scriptures so clearly. But help us to be reminded today that a lot of our leading, we we don't even know the impact we're having, but it's there. But Lord, if we're chickens, then that is so obvious and the only people that really like chickens are other chickens but we admire and follow leaders of all kinds and all stations of life and all degrees of authority so father it seems to me that the big idea today is that you've called us all to be leaders and help us to be that here more importantly everywhere we go For that, we'll give you praise, for we ask it in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. It's great to be together today. Pastor Andy will be back next Sunday. He went down to see his mama on her birthday. So that's where he is today.